In this last uh, section of PLS, we're going to talk about some additional subjects which often come up uh, dealing with calibration models. But some of these are also relevant for other parts of the overall course. Specifically, we're going to talk about pre-processing first, and then we're going to talk about varial, variable selection, how to select which variables to include in your model, and then a third part which contains a number of uh, different issues that we will shortly describe. First, pre-processing. And we will discuss why we want to do pre-processing, and we will illustrate some of the more important pre-processing techniques. The basic rationale behind pre-processing is to remove variation in the data which is not relevant for the problem that you're looking at. Some simple examples could be light scattering effects, baseline drifts, background effects, interferences, skewed distributions, and a lot of other items that could be relevant to handle in some sort. For models such as PCA and PLS, we, wo we know that they work best if the data are approximately normally distributed. That's not strictly correct. Uh, there are many subtleties in that, and in fact, the main thing is that your data look fairly normal, that your samples are distributed uh, all over the relevant range, that your residuals behave nicely, etc. So we usually don't have to think about it in a very strict statistical sense. It's more relevant to think of it in a more loose uh, sense. One part of that could be to remove uh, obvious nonlinearities. For example, we almost never use the hydrogen ion concentration. We always convert that to the pH value, so take the logarithm or the negative logarithm of the concentration, because we know that that is often more linearly related to properties that we are typically looking at. And pre-processing of the data often aims at handling these two uh, items, removing non-linearities -linear and making the data uh, look nicer, have a better distribution. Some examples. Taking derivatives and that's relevant when you have continuous data of some sort, smooth data of some sort, for example spectroscopic data or time series and uh, other types of data where you know that individual variables are correlated. We also have methods specifically for spectroscopic data, for example multiplicative signal correction, MSC. Normalization is another technique that is oftentimes used and logarithmic and other transformations of individual variables uh, can be used to handle nonlinearities. Here's an example of what derivatives look like. In the upper plot we have three different curves. And let's say that these three curves should have been identical. Well, we can see that in that case there are some baseline problems. The blue line is elevated compared to the black one and the red one has a drift. If we take the first derivative of all the curves, the blue and the black line become identical because we, rem we remove any offset in the data. If we take the second derivative, we will remove both offsets and any linear drift in the data and therefore all three curves will become identical. Now clearly if we have a situation where we would have drifts like this that does not contain any information about what we are looking at, then the lower plot is a much better representation of the data than the upper plot because the model does not have to deal with the complexity coming from the drift in the data. So in that situation we could use uh, derivatives to remove initially before the modeling any such artifacts from the data. Here's an example from the unscrambler. When you want to do derivatives in unscrambler, you have to be in your editor, so you have to have the dataset open and in front, uh, 
and then you can choose the modify menu choose transform and then derivatives and you can choose between what is called Norris and Savitsky Goulet and Savitsky Goulet is the one that is mostly used in that you have to choose different things for example the derivative order if you want to have first second or third derivative and then you have to choose a window width because it works by moving a window across the spectra or the curves and then calculating derivatives within those windows and it does that by fitting a polynomial in the window so you have to play a little bit with the window width and the degree of the polynomial and by doing that and evaluating perhaps visually or quantitatively you can get uh, suitable uh, derivatives Multiplicative scatter correction or signal correction is a technique that is often used in situations where you have light scattering effects. We're not going to talk about it in detail. It's mostly relevant if you work, for example, with near-infrared data. In that type of data, you often have different types of scattering effect that leads to offsets and amplifications that are not containing any uh, relevant chemical information what you do in MSC is that you choose an area where you know that there's little chemical information and based on that you can calculate uh, corrections that will try to remove these irrelevant effects. Here you see an example of an original data set to the left where we have huge variations but these variations from a near-infrared point of view look quite trivial and after using multiplicative signal correction, we can see that we have removed, removed a fair part of those. It might seem that there's very little information left after the correction, but that is not correct. These data are very precise and there's still lots of information to find in the corrected spectra. Normalization. Normalization is used for example in chromatography. In chromatography we can have a situation where we don't always know exactly the amount of sample that we are analyzing. So if we analyze the same sample twice, well then the amount of sample that we analyze might vary. By normalizing the curve that we get out, we basically remove the influence from the size of the sample. Otherwise, the same sample analyzed twice would lead to a difference in the magnitude of the curves that we get out. A problem, though, is that we also lose that information then in situations where we might not be interested in that, in situations where the magnitude really has a meaning with respect to the sample uh, that we're interested in. There are different ways of performing normalization for example in the unscrambler and as with many of the other pre-processing techniques mentioned so far you have to try these unless you have some specific knowledge that can guide you you just have to try the different ones and the nice thing in <coughs> in sorry in PLS is that you can evaluate quantitatively whether your pre-processing is doing good or bad because you can see if you improve your predictions so if you do one specific normalization and you evaluate through a cross-validated model that you get better predictions, well then you know that this is an, uh, an appropriate uh, pre-processing step. Here's an example of the different types of normalization that you can use in the unscrambler. Upper left we have the raw data and we can see that the different types of normalizations Will, will lead to different uh, pre-processed data and whether any of these or one of these are preferable well that depends on the specific data that you're looking at logarithmic transforms are used quite often and mostly they're used to handle skewed distributions if you plot your raw, raw data in a histogram and you see that the distribution is quite skewed then it's quite normal to use a logarithmic transform in order to get a more uh, even spread of the data.
statistically it's not a very correct way of handling uh, skewed distributions because what we're really interested in statistically is whether the residuals are evenly distributed, not the raw data. So a skewed distribution of the raw data is here means that the sampling was done badly and s solving that uh, is done by looking at how you sample your data and maybe sample differently. But in any case, it is used quite often and it is relevant to try that. And again, as with the other pre-processing steps, you can simply evaluate quantitatively whether it actually improves your model. It might also be useful sometimes just to handle uh, non-linearities in your data. We already discussed a little bit what pre-processing aims at, um, but if we wrap up, we can say that pre-processing done in a proper way will give models with better predictive performance, so lower prediction errors. Also, it will supply models that are simpler, simpler in the sense of using fewer components, because now the model does not have to deal with various variations in the data. Simpler models are generally more robust and therefore easier to interpret and also more stable over time so they will be valid uh, even with um, minor changes in uh, the types of data that you analyze. But there is also the risk that you will remove useful information from the data. Derivatives and scatter correction correct for multiplicative and additive effects. Normalization corrects for different signal sizes or amounts of sample. Important remarks are that you should always plot your data after pre-processing in order to see that the transformations you've done really make sense compared to what you expect. And always compare the effect of pre-processing by validation. So build a model on the raw data and then try various kinds of pre-processing and see if your model will improve or worsen. Also remember that pre-processing will seldom do miracles. So if you have data that are absolutely useless where you're not able to build any meaningful model, then most likely that's because you don't have the information in the data and most types of pre-processing will not be able to change that. But if you have a reasonable model, you might be able to improve that substantially by pre-processing. A, uh, a practical issue that you have to consider is that when you do uh, changes through the modify menu, then these changes will affect the data in the editor. And therefore, if you save the data after doing a pre-processing step, then you have lost your original data. The data are now pre-processed. So it's not a reversible change. So a good idea is to save the data in an original form and then do the transformations and save those in a different file. When you do censoring and scaling, that's done within the modeling menu shown to the right. So those types of pre-processing do not affect your original data. But everything that's done within the modify menu will change your data irreversibly. The next item that we will discuss is variable selection. And we will talk about why we want to do variable selection and different approaches to doing that. The most important variable selection that you can do is to choose the right measurements. That's far more important than anything you can do subsequently in your data analysis. It's beyond this course to discuss that, but it's extremely important to have measurements that you know will contain relevant information for the problem that you're working with. 